Come on up, the uh, faculty, the speakers uh, from the uh, earlier sessions, and um, we're going to have an opportunity here uh, to, uh, you know, maybe come up with some concluding uh, thoughts or uh, comments or questions or statements uh, that you know we can use to uh, tie this uh, day all together. So I think it's been a remarkable day hearing about the, um, the pathophysiology and the presentation of SMA, hearing about novel. So Richard, you've heard a lot. I mean, if, if you got, you know, we, we, we've heard a lot about what we know, but I think we're all becoming aware of what we don't know. If you got to choose one thing that you would like to know, you know, can you think of something that comes to mind that you know, really would change your approach or give you more confidence in how to deal with things? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me uh, rephrase your question. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, because uh, I don't know how to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think it, when I deal with patients, um, I, I try to focus on what are realistic expectations for that particular patient, uh, whether it's a baby recently identified that's pre-symptomatic, or a recently identified type one, type two, type three, or someone who's been living with the disease for a few years, uh, or an adult. Uh, so I think maybe that's the, to me, the most important thing is to take all the information that we're acquiring, and it's still in real time changing so fast, but to, to try to say, okay, for your child, here's what I think would be a reasonable expectation, no matter what drug we're talking about, based upon the, the status or course of that patient. And then, this, then you take the information that we currently know from the studies and from what we'll call the real world experience, since the drug's been available now more broadly, uh, especially Nusinersen, and say, okay, here, here's the data to support, you know, looking at it this way or that way, because ultimately you're trying to make a choice among the different treatments. Yeah. Uh, and as you heard earlier, I think um, it's particularly challenging now uh, for those uh, patients who are under two years of age where you have two distinct treatments, soon uh, hopefully a third that'll get more yeah. confusing. So that's the, my, been my yeah. approach. Yeah. Uh, Julie, um, yeah, one question we have, and this, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be curious with your thoughts. I mean, you know, was, uh, you know, the, one of the patients brought up the idea that that including a lot of data uh, from natural history, you know, in the discussions with patients is not always helpful. I mean. Yeah, and I think that actually really hit home. That's fascinating because we tend to be data-driven. In medicine, the pendulum is swung to being evidence-based so that we are able to make decisions based on the data that we have. So I think the message that I got from the patient panel is to ask patients what it is that they need, what information that they want, and when they want it, and to be respectful of that, to have that dialogue. Um, I think that it is, um, I wish in looking at what I would want uh, to see would be what, what will things look like five years from now? What will things look like five years in the future? So that we have a better idea of what some outcomes are going to be. I think that in this age when we are, um, as physicians, as providers, being forced to do things under time constraints and not have all of the time that we need to have with patients, I think we always have to go back to the patients, the relationships with the patients, listening to them, and to develop those relationships of trust that you really came back into medicine because of the trusting relationship and the information that you were given. So I think that listening to patients, listening to families, and having that input as we go forward to developing treatment paradigms and all, to me, really is, is key and very important. Yeah. Ellen. what everybody's doing in the early days after treatment when the patients are on prednisone, immunosuppressed, and wanting to get therapy, and how you all handle environmental exposure, and do you restrict them? You have a room full of therapists here that are treating these patients, so maybe we'd like to hear what your opinion is. I, I just have to make one quick comment about 
Zuljan's way, and just so that everybody understands this, because we have to always say this in a situation, that Zuljan'sma is not a cure for SMA. And I know that people have said that repeatedly, but this is a gene transfer therapy. It does not cure the disorder. And I think that as medical professionals and patients, people have the idea that when you have gene transfer therapy, the disorder is cured. You no longer are able to pass on SMA, and that is completely wrong. So I just need to say that to remind all of us that this is a treatment and not a cure before so, saying what we would do. Basil. Here, here you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, with gene therapy, um, I think it's very important to manage ex expectations. I'm going to continue on what Julie said, that uh, we had international patients who felt that by get, coming to Boston and getting gene therapy, they're going to have a total cure. And I had to explain to them that that's not actually the case. Um, but as far as uh, steroids, um, we're very careful to start the steroids one day before the infusion of the vector, and then we continue for uh, two to three months. And I prefer three months instead of two months um, uh, because I just feel there is some risk, but uh, we do lower the dose. If everything goes well, after four weeks, we lower the dose by 50%. And then after the second month, we go down to 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day and eventually gets discontinued. Uh, but during this period of time, we try to make sure the child is not exposed to other patients who have, uh, people who have infections um, and, and all that. And very recently, a question came about immunizations. Uh, what do you do? Because of a child from Cyprus who actually had not received a lot of immunizations. And we had to go back and forth decide what to do. And we decided that uh, given the child was immunocompromised from the uh, steroid and not to give all the immunizations the mother was asking, um, we just gave Synagis and the flu vaccine, uh, but uh, we decided to defer the vaccinations for, for, for the future. Yeah. I've taken a somewhat stringent approach. Uh, it, at the point where a family's considering the Zolgensma treatment, I basically put the baby in lockdown. Um, and I send them home with some masks, the parents, um, I suggest that they restrict uh, visitors that don't don't take their child unnecessarily out into the public uh, to try to limit the exposure even before they come in. Because if that child gets sick between the, the screening where you're sending off the antibody and you're confirming the diagnosis, which may, and it may take a week or two weeks to actually get it all insurance authorized, if that baby gets sick, uh, you're gonna have to delay treatment because you're not going to give the gene therapy to a sick baby. Uh, so, and you don't want to delay treatment, right? So I tend to say keep the child somewhat protected. Um, don't let every grandma come in and you know, start you know, <laughs> kissing them. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> uh, and, if, and try to avoid going to like, don't take the baby to church and this and that if you, for a while. Do you send and then the I continue that. Away? I'm sorry? Do you send the older sibling away? I, I keep the older sibling away, yes. Um, unless they're gonna be old enough to, to wear a mask, because they're bringing germs home from daycare and preschool, and so they're walking germ factories. So um, I try, and I say you, they need to use either gloves or a mask, that, that the chair, and if the mother, if, you know, one of the parents always seems to work in something where they're exposed to a lot of stuff. So I said, well, if you have any concerns, you wear a mask. Um, and then during the course of the prednisone treatment, it, it's equally important because if they do get infected, then they're immune suppressed and you know, the, the extent of the infection might be magnified, as we've learned you know, in, in an unfortunate example. So, uh, so my point is, it's that week or two before treatment that's equally important, as well as the two months or maybe three months on steroids. Yeah, yeah so I oh, think that this yeah. is- To the PT though, I, one, I'm sorry. I do encourage that they continue PTs, but the PTs, um, if they come to the house, then it's great. They just sort of put on a mask and the gloves and they 
work with a baby, um, but you have to be really careful if you're gonna be taking the, the child to a treatment center. If it's a, let's say it's a older child, um, then the parents really have to decide that. But also if they take them to the pediatrician, uh, request to go in the back door, not, don't sit in the waiting room um, where you're exposed to all the other sick kids, that sort of thing. Right. I want just to add that when we are doing the recommendations for treatment and we talk about this uh, course of uh, corticosteroids, it's important for the families to know um, the side effects that they might experience, such as irritability, all of the same, the sweet babies have a very hard time sleeping, and they think that it might be a complication of the treatment, but indeed it is a very common side effect of steroids. And the same is for the reflux that might be already there, but not to a point that you need as a physician to treat it medically, and then during the course of the prednisone, that is when you will do as well. So there might be things that the parents think that it could be a side effect of the new treatment and indeed it's just because of the concomitant treatment with the prednisone. But if we focus on the safety of the therapist and how safe you are, the AV9 capsid is a capsid that's not infectious. And so um, we know that after treatment with Zolgensma, that basically within 24 hours, saliva, urine, blood, the capsid is really um, diminished markedly. So in the stool, it's about 30 days that you can still recover the capsid. So what we do recommend for families is that they, you know, use gloves, good hand washing and all. And I would say the same thing for you as therapists. You're washing your hands constantly, right? Um, but it's really the stool that is the, the product that you need to be careful of. But, you know, if you're, if you're pregnant, if you're a woman, if you are exposed to the child and doing therapy, you specifically are not in danger of an infectious agent because it's the capsid that it's not a virus that is going to infect you. I don't know that uh, everybody is aware of the fact that if you are antibody positive, that nullifies your po possible benefit from being treated. So maybe about 5% of the babies already are exposed in one way or another or had passive transfer of antibody from mother to baby, uh, and therefore they're not eligible for treatment with Zilgensma. Uh, and of course, AAV uh, is a kind of nature's uh, mechanism to allow you to carry out gene therapy. Uh, so it's going to be used increasingly. For example, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the microdystrophin therapy that's being developed uses AAV. So if you're exposed and positive, then you no longer have an opportunity to be treated in this way. And so 5% so of the infants and maybe as many as 60% of the adults have already been exposed to AAV and have antibodies against it so when it's introduced in the form of a viral vector, it immediately nullifies the benefit. And that's why testing is done before you are treated to determine when you're, whether you're antibody positive. So this issue of viral shedding that is going on it is a potentially serious concern because people may be exposed to the viral shedding, they don't get the disease, but it does eliminate the possibility that they could be treated with an AAV-associated uh, uh, viral transfer therapy, I mean, gene ther transfer therapy in the future as such. Yep. And if there are siblings in the family that are affected, um, you, need, you don't want the sibling to get, quote, immunized against the AAV. Because let's say, for example, now a little, a little baby, an infant gets treated with this algesma, but there's an older sibling over age two that's not currently eligible. But let's say in the near future, um, the labeling is expanded to allow treatment for an older child, and then you don't want to eliminate the possibility of treatment for that older child by uh, being immunized and having an antibody titer. No, I think those are really all, like, all great points. I think, you know, we're all, struck by the awesome power of gene replacement therapy and you know I think everything that it can do I think we all are also somewhat intimidated by it I mean we're aware of of the side effects that do occur you know not currently at a very high rate but you know it's we had one of our patients on steroids for more than six months 
because there were signs that the uh, liver remained inflamed for that long a period of time. So this is, you know, this is serious. And, and you know, we know of in, um, in this trial that with this, with this treatment or with other treatments, kids who have gotten really very sick and so, you know, it, it, we, it has to be dealt with carefully. There's no question. I mean, you know, it's, it's a very important treatment, but one that has to be, we're still so early in the stages of this. There are just a few hundred patients that have been dosed. And so, you know, we're going to have a lot more to learn about it, and we want to learn it in a controlled way. So I think it's all, all great. John, I don't know if you want to um, comment on the breastfeeding. Uh, during the treatment. I think that that was uh, something that was raised with one of our patients recently. Go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, because it was controverted even among yeah. ourselves, uh, we, um, we were um, told that uh, we, we needed to stop uh, the breastfeeding for this patient, and we were wondering why. Uh, but that, you know, that was advice until, I guess, that it was a month um, of of the, the first month after the treatment, right, and then they will can uh, start with the yeah, breastfeeding. Yeah, I mean, feed. there there really were no guidelines. So you stop yeah. and think about it; it makes no sense. I mean, you know, the, the baby's going to develop immunity to the uh, to the vector itself on their own, irrespective of anything that comes through the breast milk. But I mean, that's how how new we are in this. Is what I would say is that you know some of these guidelines have yet to be written. So um, yeah, so we're we're finding our way through this. Um, so, yeah, please. For Zolgensma, for anything. So, Three days. Uh, uh, the question is how long does it take if somebody is identified via newborn screening for a child to get treated? And, and I would break that into two, let's say for Zolgensma and for Spinraza. Yeah, but Spinraza has now been out long enough, it's usually three days. Okay. And Zolgensma, two weeks. Uh, Yeah, so it, would it, it, and I'm giving kind of flippant answers because it, it, it's moving so quickly. I think once the insurance companies are more comfortable with old Gensma, it's going to be three days. Um, they realize that um, while these are really expensive drugs, they work, and they, they realize that you need to treat it early as possible to get the best bang for your buck, so to speak. So um, at least where I am, uh, the once they became comfortable with the criteria of this, it's a checklist, and you fill out the checklist, and you say this this baby fit, fulfills all the check all the boxes, and you send it in, and we get the authorization the next day, and we order the drug, and it comes FedEx the next day, and we can start treatment typically three days later. I, I think Solgesma will get there too. It's it's just the companies aren't quite as far along in that process. Uh, so with a little patient, probably six months or a year, I suspect it'll, it'll be similar. I'm not as optimistic as Rick is, because I think that with Zolgensma, at least from a practical standpoint, not talking about just acquisition of the drug, but with newborn screening programs, you have to have the newborn screen, the newborn screen yeah. comes back, you, the pediatrician is informed, the center is informed, you need to bring the family in, do an assessment with the baby, do antibody testing with the screening labs, get the weight on the baby, um, and then be able to order the drug. So we've That's sort of true. looked but you, at... you have to confirm the diagnosis also. You have to confirm the diagnosis testing. at the time of doing that. So we have actually looked at, at probably realistically for us 21 days is what our target is for that entire process to take place because we do need to have confirmation as right. well. So we'll bring the baby in. As soon as we know, we'll bring the baby in, have a conversation. Again, the poor parents are in shock. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. Most of them don't have you know, other children who have been affected, and so it takes some time to have that conversation um, and then be able to actually get, hopefully, commercial approval. And I think Rick is right about that, that that will come, that we're able to get commercial approval for treatment, but we're actually targeting 21 days in the newborn screening program um, to be able to treat the, the baby. We're not maybe quite as quick as you are. Well, you still have to do antibody testing. You still have to have confirmation. Yeah. So you yeah. still need to do that prior to being able to treat. But, but as I said previously, having prenatal diagnosis or even just having prenatal carrier testing with discussion of diagnosis is really helpful. In some laboratories, the, confirm the confirmation would take sometimes two weeks. But there are now a few laboratories, and I want to give the names we can get, 
confirmation within a number of days. Uh, but even with that, but you have to do the antibody testing and all that. So I would say that uh, it's more than two weeks uh, by the time. Is that too long? I mean, you know, we say we want to treat early. What's, you know, is two weeks, is waiting two weeks too long? And yeah. another uh, aspect to your question uh, is whether we could stagger the treatments yeah. so that you might be able to go right ahead with antisense oligonucleotides as you prepare for the possibility of giving gene therapy or some other such combination. And I have no investment in one way or the other. I just introduce it as an additional idea that has to be considered. Uh, and I think we're perhaps in a better position to do something like that where we've had a lot of experience, let's say, with... Uh, uh, with Spinraza, we've had less experience with the other agents. Uh, we like to maintain equipoise in terms of one versus the other, and that's always a big challenge when the family turns to you and say, well, doctor, what would you do if this were your child? And that's a challenging question to be asked under the circumstance because you don't want to introduce a biased thought about one or the other. Uh, you want to be as... Uh, neutral as possible and try to understand as I think was discussed earlier that one size does not fit all that is there are different ways to approach it there are different challenges different issues that uh, are being raised uh, and you have to take all of those into consideration and work with the family to allow them to participate and make the decision that fits best for them but it may be in dealing with these other issues uh, and I would say one other thing. I'm not certain every institution in the United States is necessarily in a position to do the right thing in, in these complicated uh, care issues that we're talking about. And one might consider the possibility of having regional centers of excellence that do this day in and day out in such a way that we can minimize the delays and the anecdotal approach to these various issues, and we have a very systematized uh, approach to each of these uh, issues. So, you know, I had understood, uh, so is the antibody test sole source? Is there only one laboratory that's offering that? Is it a licensed test, I guess? Well, I think if... I think it's CTL is the is the lab that's used, and if you if you send it to a commercial lab uh, for genetic confirmation and the antibody, the anti AAV nine, they then uh, use CTL. But it, it it comes back remarkably quickly. I have to say. However, they yeah. I mean I had one come back this week in two days. We sent it Tuesday. We got it Thursday afternoon. We got the results back, both the antibody and. Uh, the gene confirmation. So I, I'd understood that it was it was sole source for that, and and the cost is seventeen hundred bucks. And as a geneticist, I can do whole exome sequencing and somebody for two hundred dollars less than that. Uh, so it, it seemed like um, you know the confirmation test, which you know is a ninety dollar test, and an antibody test, which is a ninety dollar test. Seventeen hundred seems well, a the, little steep. Yeah, but uh, the Avexis company facilitates this. Um, so the challenge often is if you have a baby that's an inpatient, as you know, it's, there's a financial challenge to the institution to do any genetic testing uh, of any sort because it gets bundled into your DRG payment and all that nonsense. Uh, but, it, but Avexis is, has a good uh, policy. In my mind, it's quite good because there's a kit. Um, so if you have the kits available, you can draw the blood on the inpatient, which is what I did on Monday, um, and uh, you just send it off, uh, and it goes to the reference lab, and the results come back, and there was no charge uh, to the host, to the institution. Uh, so that really helped facilitate uh, things. And then, depending on the antibody, if the antibody level was high, you would tell the parents, well, 
the Zoltanzma is not an option for your baby now. You have the option of waiting, and it might go down if you waited a month. I wouldn't advise waiting a month, personally, because the disease is likely to progress. So you have the other option of Spinraza, and maybe in, in, the, in the near future, Rizdiplam. So e there's sort of an algorithm, I think, that we each follow uh, based upon this, the baby's situation. Great. Ethical question. Do you think at some point we're going to face patients or families that are not comfortable with doing the therapy and that they'll be forced into giving these the children the treatment um, without their approval? It, will this be a governmental intervention where people will be forced to treat a child with, let's say, SMN um, with only two, one or two copies of SMN2? That is a really important question, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start the answer, but I think we all probably have strong thoughts on this. Um, I think it's important to emphasize to families that even uh, it, when you're treating a symptomatic baby, that it, this is not a cure. Maybe in selected uh, pre-symptomatic newborns, it might be, but I think you, you have to make clear to the parents that this is not a, a cure, and that this child is, will likely improve substantially, both in the chances for long-term survival and improved motor function, uh, but will still have perhaps significant limitation. And in, uh, so I'll just share one example quickly of uh, a little baby, a type one baby, where the, uh, the father's a family practitioner, mother a nurse, and they elected not to treat. They said their thinking, uh, which you could argue it many was, I, I don't want my daughter to uh, grow up and not able to be independent. Even if this is a wonderful drug, it's not wonderful enough. To You're telling me it's unlikely that she's going to grow up and be an independent adult. I said, well, we have plenty of our type 2 patients who are functioning really quite well as adults. I mean, you have to define what, in your mind, is independent. Uh, so there was, uh, that was sort of an eye-opening experience for me. But to your point, I think, yes, we do have an obligation to make sure the expectations are clear. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And um, it hasn't happened to me as yet uh, with SMA, but it did happen with other, you know, similar conditions, Pompe's disease, where... Um, the the family well now in two cases one case is that was before the new, uh, the newborn screening for Pompeys where it was a classic three months old and then we were offering treatment but he was quite symptomatic at the time and then the family uh, decided not to do treatment and, uh, and that was an eye opening to me because they say I don't want my child to be 10 15 years of age with a complicated pneumonia and I have to make the decision whether you know to continue with support or not, and or, or having him having to make a decision of that end. And then to me, as much as I wanted them to say yes to the treatment, I say, we need to respect this. And then recently we have another case where through the newborn screening, again, no SMA, but Pompeys, the family was not accepting the diagnosis. And this is a different issue. So here it was not about the treatment, but again, they were seeing a baby that looked normal. So why? to believe us that these, all these things would ha will happen if we don't provide treatment. So I think that these are very important ethical considerations as we're moving in this era of treatment. So uh, I'll just share. I got a call several months ago from an ethics committee at another hospital in another state um, where the parents had elected not to treat. And the treating doctor felt that that was wrong and took it to the ethics committee and wanted actually almost to bring a, like a lawsuit or something crazy uh, to s almost force them to say you have to treat. And I said, no, I don't think ethically that's right at all. You have, you know, so, but it, it, sometimes it gets, it spins out of control. And I think it's still listening to families, and I think that this may evolve over time in terms of what the ethics of treatment are and the ethics of offering treatment, but all of us have had some similar experiences um, with, with families who have, who have a child with SMA who elect not to treat having another child who would be 
typically a, a severe phenotype um, and have elected not to treat. We had a family, and this is devastating for our entire team because we have the ability to treat and we know what some of the outcomes are, but we had a, a young family, um, parents were in their 20s, they lived in rural Montana, and they came in with their four-month-old baby who was symptomatic, and we gave them all of the options. Um, they're trail runners, they're campers, they're mountain people, um, and they didn't have a good financial base either, and their decision not to treat was based on incredible love for their baby, but saying that um, we cannot we cannot have sort of the financial toxicity that is involved with any of these treatments. We aren't um, connected to medical facilities that are able to handle the treatments that are available, and um, we are choosing now to say no because um, we feel that that's in the best interest of our family and our future family. And so I think, again, all of us have different stories of listening to what our patients are telling us about, about treatment. And I think it's very hard for all of us, knowing what treatments we have available, saying we want to treat everybody. I think that's our inclination is always to try to make patients better, but I think there are cases where maybe um, in a loving family situation with good consideration and information that that's not the family choice. I so, think Dr. Day knows that earlier today, he and I talked a little bit about this. I complimented him and his colleagues on putting together a really fantastic program that we've enjoyed up through the present time and look forward to it tomorrow as well. But I said, next time you do it, you have to have a session on the issue of ethics mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to what we're talking about right now and many other, many other areas uh, that have been touched upon today, such as you know, advising or talking with families about what choice to make when they have a diagnosis presented to them, spinal muscular atrophy. Well, and the financial side of this gets to be an ethical issue in and of itself, so I think that that's another part of this. I want to pull us back to a different area uh, to end on, and that is you know, more on the hopeful side. I think that you know, uh, the, the, the take home message here is optimistic, is hopeful that, that you know, we do have new treatments. But I think that uh, Sharice brought up uh, something really, really compelling to me um, when she showed that, that uh, page of, of all of Lucy's providers. And I, I, it gives me pause because I think we're all acknowledging that it takes a team to manage this, that we are increasing the number of patients living with it. How do we do this? So I'm curious, Connie or Mimi, I mean, how do we, how do we coordinate this in a sane way so that we can, uh, you know, help people, you know, kind of manage um, all of this wonderful new approach that's being developed? I, I wish I had the answer. I think it's probably very uh, patient and family dependent. Um, they, it's like you said, you, you don't realize what you can handle until you're faced with that. And uh, most, I'm sure most families would say the same, but um, you know, some, some parents will have the capability of, of incorporating a lot of things on their own. Some will require more assistance and some will need to be a little more hands off. So it's, I think you have to take it on a case by case basis. Um, I think that um, with the new treatments, I think there's so much hope, but it's really a change in focus. I mean, as a pediatric pulmonologist, all previously all our clinic visits were based on survival. Like really, what can you do to keep your baby alive? And um, now it's really like talking about how to keep your child thriving and to um, do exercises to um, make their lungs um, stronger. And I always tell my patients that I, we have to learn together. This is a new, um, we're embarking on a new journey. Um, we don't know all the answers and we have to do it together with the goal of what's right for your child. I think um, I, Angie also kind of brought, and several of you said this in different ways of having a life outside that of being a patient. Everything we ask you to do takes hours out of your day. Every hour of therapy is time that you aren't spending socializing. Uh, spending time coming to clinic and getting LPs puts you back in the role of a patient where you weren't before, is how do we 
make this treatment give you more of your life back, not being a patient instead of more of it? Is there ways we could be f more efficient in our multi D clinic, do more in one visit, do things by video conference, something to give you back more of that non-patient time? Uh, I think there are ways we could make it easier on you. So I think you've all earned some wine and cheese, and I think we'll, we'll kind of uh, transition to that. I would ask that all the faculty, Hank somehow disappeared. I don't know if he can come back up and for a photograph, I mean, and all the faculty for tomorrow up here. And the patients, I again, want to thank. And if you want to be part of our photo, you're more than welcome. So thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.